Spiral Dial Sci-Fi with a Soundscape The first sensation she remembered was a coolness on her forehead as if someone had placed a damp flannel on her face. She felt somebody stroking her hair, slowly. Somebody who cared about her. It reminded her of her mother, when she was a little girl, back when she had been loved. She took a deep breath in and out and felt no pain. There was something in her arm, something tight around her elbow. Remembering what had happened, she stretched her fingers, but they felt fine. Opening her eyes, she could not make much out. The room was bathed in a soft orange light. It seemed distorted somehow. There was a large tree next to her bed, growing strange, shaped fruit. A low-hanging branch dangled right next to her, bearing a heavy load. A pair of deflated gourds filled with a clear, iridescent fluid. It looked strangely familiar. Perhaps she had travelled to this place before, in her old life. Her mouth was dry, lips cracked. Her breath echoed in her ears. She gazed at the ceiling, afraid to look down at her hands. She could feel her fingers, slightly cool. Squinting to her left, she realised that the tree was in fact a drip stand and that she had a cannula in her left arm giving her fluids. She touched the tip of each finger to her thumb experimentally. They all seemed to be intact. So, she must be on antibiotics. That made sense, but how the hell had that happened? Her last memory had been passing out on a sofa in the company of an intoxicated drummer. Lifting her head, she tried to sit up and see her surroundings. She discovered a plain white wall and a steel door. At least there was a door. That was a start. It meant that she had some hope of opening it. Stretching the fingers of her left hand, she gingerly pulled it from beneath the sheet. It seemed to move normally and the sheet felt crisp beneath her skin. Still not daring to look, she considered whether she could be moving a phantom hand, an echo of what she had once possessed. This was ridiculous. She had amputated endless limbs herself on the battlefield, so losing one herself would be no less than her due. Forcing herself to get it together, she deliberately moved her eyes downwards. Her hand looked completely normal. Her first reaction was to thank God for his mercy. Perhaps Patricia had been right. The ship had changed her. Her breath still sounded unusually loud within her own head and was very slightly stronger in her right ear. Very slowly, she turned her head towards that side and discovered that she was not alone. A plump, elderly woman lay in the bed next to her, hair an indeterminate shade of grey. She did not stir. Beyond her, she could see another bed, although she could not quite make out its occupant. She gave the whole room a thorough visual inspection. No other entrances or exits, no windows, plain white walls, no obvious ventilation shafts, no evidence of anyone nursing them or indeed of anyone watching them. Instinctively, she felt her neck. The watch necklace remained in place. Performing an experimental stretch, her body felt good, if a little stiff. She swung her legs over the side of the bed. The others did not stir. The two bags of fluid were both empty and unlabeled. Whatever they had been filling her up with, it seemed to have done the trick. Removing the drip from her arm, she stood. She was clad only in a knee-length hospital gown, covered in faint purple spirals from top to bottom. Listening carefully at the door, 
she could detect no activity outside. The handle would not budge. Remembering her previous confinement, she decided to try to pray her way out of the room. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. What in God's name do you think you're doing? Some of us are trying to get some kep. Archie's indignant voice filled the small room. Jessica recoiled from the door, scarcely believing her own ears. Her first reaction was intense relief, which disturbed her. Had she really thought that everything she remembered had happened? More than that, why should she care whether he lived or died? Slowly, she turned around. Her eyes confirmed the evidence of her ears. It was he, sitting up in the far bed, hair sticking up on end and sporting at least a couple of weeks' worth of stubble. Archie, is it you? I'm always me, he retorted. At least I have been for a while. What the hell happened to you? Did I hear you praying? Jessica didn't know quite how to respond to that, so she pretended she hadn't heard. What are you doing in here anyway? He continued. I wasn't expecting you down here. Well, I'm not quite sure myself. I had some sort of infection in my hand. The last thing I remember, I was backstage with Jeff and I suppose he must have brought me down here. She tailed off, hesitant. What had happened? The talent show, crucifixion, clinic and captain's office all jumbled together in a kaleidoscope of fragmented memory. Archie sprung up from his bed, surprisingly energetic. You look like you've seen a ghost. Come on, have a seat. He guided her to his bed and she sat gratefully. She felt that sudden warmth again where he touched her. Glancing up at him, she decided to take a chance. Can I trust you, Archie? Of course you can, he replied. He seemed genuine. I think you might be able to help me understand what's going on. I've been seeing some strange things, some horrible things, but I know they can't be real because you're here. I saw... She trailed off, looking up at him. He seemed calmed, attentive. I saw you die, she said. There it was. He didn't appear to be at all concerned. This is awful, but I... I killed you. I killed you, myself. He displayed a total lack of surprise at her disclosure. Oh, people are always telling me that on here. Between you and me, I think Patricia puts a little something in the wine at mass just to amuse herself. Not that she's the only one taking those sorts of liberties, is she? He produced a small piece of paper from the folds of his gown and held it triumphantly before her eyes. The ticket from the lab. Didn't think I'd noticed, did you? What have you got to say for yourself? Her trip to the lab seemed an awfully long time ago now. Anger stood within her. What do you want? An apology? You were dead. Then I got fired. I've been tortured for God's sake. Not only that, I've been subjected to some sort of bizarre pre-mating knitting ritual. And now you've got the bloody nerve to ask me questions. Around halfway through her outburst, Archie burst into his characteristic impressive cackle. Oh, calm down, darling. I'm not upset. I just think it's too funny. All of it. Of course you're angry. I can see that. Do you want a hug? His eyes were wide, almost coquettish. No, I don't want a bloody hug. I want you to tell me what this piece of paper means. I want to know what the hell is going on on the ship. Above all, I want to know if I'm losing my mind. She realised that she had been shouting. Pausing, she waited for his response. He was no longer laughing and appeared deep in thought. If I'm right, we've got about an hour or so before the others come to get us. We might as well chill until then. Why don't you tell me your thoughts? And then maybe together 
we will be able to work out some answers. She felt reassured by this. He edged closer to her on the bed, his thigh pressing against hers. She shuffled slightly away. Let's focus then. This piece of paper. You know where it comes from? He shrugged. It was part of the lab tour Bill gave me. Before we started focusing on fun stuff. So what? So what does it mean? He looked at it carelessly before throwing it on the floor. It means that you've been trespassing. End of story. She retrieved it and looked again, more closely this time. It reminds me of something in biology class. Well, you're the doctor. Biology should be your special subject. Actually, I'm surprisingly rusty on this sort of thing. You only really remember the information you use all of the time. She folded the paper carefully and tucked it into the only small pocket of her gown. There's something else. I saw a dead body. Down in the lab. The first time we went. It can't have been Patricia. You remember? When we rescued Finn. He nodded. I remember. But darling, if you saw a dead body, why on earth didn't you mention it? Don't you trust me? An awkward pause followed. It's clear we have some work to do on our relationship, he huffed. Jessica did a double take. Relationship? I may not be clear about much right now, but I am very clear on this. We are not in a relationship. We're both people, aren't we? And you are talking to me? You've met me before? We've had several conversations? We've even got high together. I think that counts as a relationship. She treated him to an extra long edition of a special glare. We are not in a relationship. Neither will we ever be in one. So dream on. Archie tutted. I can see you have a lot to learn. Didn't teach you this at medical school, did they? Have you heard of relationship anarchy? Jessica had not. Neither was she interested in hearing about it. No, is this relevant to me finding a corpse in the lab? Archie continued without batting an eyelid. That's what I thought. Well, pay attention. It's very important you understand this if you want to be happy on this ship. Relationship anarchy means that you treat all of your relationships equally. It's non-hierarchical, egalitarian approach to human interaction. A relationship anarchist rejects all forms of control, whether administered by the state, God, or another human. We just let magic happen between two autonomous beings, while treating everyone with respect, of course. Right, so when you say magic, I take it you mean, well, shagging, Jessica replied. You're so very cynical for such an attractive woman. But I like that about you, very much. Anyway, no and yes, I mean, obviously, yes and no. Does that make sense? He grinned. It makes just about as much sense as anything else I've ever heard you say. Jessica reached into her pocket for the piece of paper. She needed something to focus on. Archie grabbed her hand. You're not hearing me, Jessica. Ever since we met, I've been feeling this tension between us. Maybe it's just me, but I, I had to know if you felt the same way. She met his gaze. Yes, I suppose I do, but I don't see how that's relevant to anything. I'm here to do a job. At least I was here to do a job, and now I'm just trying to stay alive. And if you have any regard for me at all, then you'll help me work this out instead of talking in riddles. I've had enough of the bullshit. I need to know what's going on. And you know what's going on, don't you? He cocked his head to one side slightly. What makes you think I have any answers? I'm just here for a good time. That is it. So death, torture and murder and rape is your idea of a good time? Now you mention it. It does sound very much like a pretty amazing party I threw for my birthday a few years back. Jessica made a move to rise, and he stopped her, gripping her forearm. Think about it, Jessica. 
If I knew what was going on, why would I be stuck in here with you? You've been tripping out on Patricia's special brew for sure, as have I. Some kind souls just hooked us up to get out of our system. I promise you that's all this is. We'll get out of here and get you back to your cabin. All it is? I am not okay with some random woman putting drugs in my food. Archie raised his eyebrows. Aren't you now? I suppose I could say the same. I might take it up with the captain, actually. Then you'll lose your job for real. How about that? She glared up at him again, before realising that he was creasing up, and she couldn't help cracking a smile. Come on, Jessica. Think about it. You're telling me you were tortured. He ran his fingers slowly down her arm, leaving a tingle in their wake. Yet there's not a mark on you. You're telling me you found a dead body, and yet you didn't report it to a soul. I know this ship is a little on the far side of weird, but these things simply aren't possible. It just takes a little time for reality to settle in here, but you'll get there in the end. Jessica shook her head. It sounded so reasonable when he said it. Archie continued. Anyway, now that's all been clarified, I'd like to go back to my previous point. As I was saying, I've been feeling some powerful chemistry between us. And now we're alone, I think we've got at least half an hour before anyone comes to disturb us. What do you think? I think the whole thing is absurd, she said. But her body wasn't agreeing with her. He reached up and unclipped her hair. You know, in that gown with your hair loose, you look just like a pre-Raphaelite painting. Jessica wasn't sure who or what the pre-Raphaelites were, but decided to assume that this was some form of compliment. And your eyes are the most remarkable shade of blue I've ever seen. She interrupted him. Green. Pardon? My eyes. They're green. If you're trying to seduce me, you could at least get that right. I promise you they're blue. Bright blue. Just like mine. I think that's why I find you so attractive. Right. Jessica got up, crossing to the steel door, and studied her reflection. The edges of her face swirled softly atop the polished steel surface. To her surprise, he was right. Her eyes were blue, just like his. I told you they were blue. What's the matter with you, Jessica? She continued to glare at her own reflection. It felt like she had become half of a new person. Lifting her hand, she traced the outline of her figure on the door. The metal felt cool beneath her fingers. As she touched it, she thought she saw a shadow on her hand, a remnant of the contagion. She jumped back in horror, almost falling. Immediately she felt Archie behind her, supporting her weight. She let herself relax back into him. He held her firmly, tighter than she was expecting. As he released her, she turned towards him. All of a sudden he was holding her tight. His chest felt firm against her, firmer than she had expected. She extricated herself slowly, letting her hair fall across her eyes so that she would not have to meet his gaze. As she did so, she caught sight of the bed in the middle of the room. She had completely forgotten that there was another person in there. Shaking her head, she looked once more. Long, tangled curls spread across the pillow. Something didn't look right. The figure seemed slight and yet it had a prominent belly, so prominent that it looked almost like they might be pregnant. Impossible. Jessica looked up at Archie. Who is that? In here with us? He shrugged. How do you know she won't wake up? I don't really care if she does. Worst case scenario, she joins in, right? He quipped. 
Jessica ignored him and walked over to the lady's bedside. The worn features looked strangely familiar, too familiar. Pulling back the sheet, she realised that this lady was not plump, but pregnant. In fact, it looked like she could give birth at any moment. How can this be possible? All thoughts of romance instantly shattered as she realised who lay before her. Her skin was now sallow, her hair as grey as the woman performing in the talent show earlier. But there was no mistake in her identity. It was Amy. Amy, 50 years older than she had last seen her. Amy, 50 years older than she had last seen her. Time seemed to stand still for a moment as her mind raced to make sense of the evidence in front of her eyes. Just then, the door opened precipitously and the rest of the band piled in. Good evening, my sleeping beauties, Jeff roared. Time to rise and shine. Sound check starts in 15 minutes and I absolutely promised Patricia we'd get there on time for once. Jesus, Jeff. You know, for a drummer, you have absolutely no sense of timing. Didn't I tell you last time Archie launched into a lengthy tirade on the subject of privacy? Jessica remained at Amy's bedside, locked in thought. Automatically, she felt for her pulse. Her skin felt paper thin almost too fragile to touch, a dead woman's skin, pressing on her collarbones, hoping against hope to elicit a response none came. She lifted her eyelids, checking the effect of the light. Just as she did, Amy's whole body seemed to contract, almost lifting off the bed. Her breathing got faster and faster, her wrists now bent, with fingers extended grotesquely at an odd angle. Her lips started twitching, skin the colour of fine, pale, porcelain, fragile. Jessica felt her stomach and knew that it was time. The baby was coming. <laughs> 